A jolt in the night rattled seismographs across the Pacific Northwest when, at precisely 11.45 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on Thursday, September 25th, a magnitude 5.9 earthquake ruptured beneath the North Pacific Ocean. The United States Geological Survey located the epicenter roughly 231 kilometers west of Bandon, Oregon, its focus only 10 kilometers or about 6 miles below the seafloor. Within hours, Two smaller shocks of magnitude 3.0 each followed, one 238 kilometers west of Bandon and the other 228 kilometers west-northwest. The question that arises immediately is simple yet haunting. What mechanism tore the crust at that moment and how does it tie into the larger menace of Cascadia? Is this only a fleeting slip on an obscure fault or is it a reminder of how tightly wound the tectonic system has become off the Oregon coast? The earthquake occurred not within the continental crust nor deep inside the Gorda Plate to the south, but squarely on the Juan de Fuca Plate near its southern edge, in the vicinity of the Blanco Fracture Zone. To grasp the significance, one must picture the regional tectonic map. The Juan de Fuca Plate, a remnant of the ancient Farallon, spreads outward from the Juan de Fuca Ridge at a modest few centimetres per year, only to be consumed beneath North America along the Cascadia subduction zone. At its southern boundary, however, this small plate does not simply end. Instead, it grinds laterally past the Pacific Plate along a sprawling strike-slip system known as the Blanco Fracture Zone. This is a dextral or right lateral transform boundary hundreds of kilometers long, connecting the Juan de Fuca Ridge in the north to the Gorda Ridge in the south. Every slip along Blanco represents crustal blocks shoving past one another horizontally, their jagged surfaces interlocking until strain is too great. The earthquake of September 25th appears to be one such release of accumulated shear stress. The Blanco system is not a simple single fault line, but a segmented set of ridges and valleys slicing the sea floor. Marine geophysical surveys have revealed long parallel scarps, fault valleys several kilometers wide, and strike-slip offsets of sea floor features that trace a history of persistent right lateral shear. Satellite geodesy and ocean bottom seismometry have confirmed that the Blanco fracture accommodates the differential motion between the northern Juan de Fuca plate and the Pacific Plate to its south. Each rupture there helps balance the relative spreading of the Juan de Fuca Ridge and the offset activity of the Gorda Ridge. It is an oceanic transform zone in the truest sense, a scar of crustal motion that manifests in repeated moderate earthquakes, usually ranging from magnitude 5 to magnitude 7. In this case, the rupture depth of 10 kilometers is telling. It indicates that the earthquake propagated through the brittle upper lithosphere of the Juan de Fuca plate rather than along the deeper ductile boundary. The style of faulting, though not yet fully constrained by moment tensor solutions, is consistent with right lateral strike-slip motion on one of the Blanco segments. Such mechanisms typically produce strong horizontal shaking but minimal vertical displacement of the sea floor, which explains why no significant tsunami was generated despite the offshore location. Transform quakes are notoriously inefficient at raising large water waves because the vertical component of motion is negligible. Yet to dismiss this event as inconsequential would be to miss its importance. The Blanco Fracture Zone is a critical part of the Cascadia tectonic puzzle. While it does not lie on the megathrust interface itself, it shares mechanical stresses with the subduction environment. The Juan de Fuca plate is caught in a paradox. It is being stretched apart at its ridge to the west, sheared sideways at Blanco to the south, and simultaneously forced beneath North America to the east. Each of these motions exerts its own strain regime, and together they leave the small plate riddled with weakness. Geophysicists often describe it as a microplate under siege, squeezed by larger neighbours, constantly reshaped by forces on all sides. In that light, the 5.9 quake is not just a local slip, but part of the ceaseless struggle of plates to adjust to incompatible motions. What risks does this pose to Cascadia itself? History provides the sobering answer. The Cascadia subduction zone, extending about 1,000 kilometers from Northern California to Vancouver Island, is fully locked along most of its length. That means the Juan de Fuca plate 
is currently stuck against North America, sliding not at all, even as convergence continues at a few centimetres per year. Strain therefore builds silently year after year, century after century. Geological evidence shows that in January of the year 1700, the entire margin broke in one catastrophic event, likely magnitude 9.0, dropping coastal forests into the tide and launching a Pacific-wide tsunami recorded in Japan. That was 325 years ago. Given recurrence intervals inferred from turbidities and coastal stratigraphy, Cascadia is due. The Blanco Fracture Zone, being the southern outlet of stress, is not the source of the Great Quake, but it reflects the same system under pressure. Seismologists caution that no single magnitude 5 or 6 event on Blanco can trigger the megathrust. The processes are related but not causally linked in such a direct sense. Still, each rupture is data. It tells us where stress is concentrating, how the Juan de Fuca plate is straining, and whether any coupling changes might be occurring. Ocean bottom seismometer deployments expanded in recent years are beginning to reveal subtle interactions. For example, certain Blanco quakes appear to cluster near times of slow slip events further north on Cascadia. These episodic tremor and slip events, which recur every year or so beneath Washington and British Columbia, represent deep plate interface creep. While causation remains elusive, the timing hints that the system's different parts do communicate. A slip at Blanco is not isolated. It reverberates through the plate's entire stress field. The September 25th sequence also underscores the hazard scale. A 5.9, though moderate, releases energy equivalent to several hundred thousand tons of TNT, yet pales against what Cascadia can unleash. A magnitude 9 is about 32,000 times more energetic. The contrast illustrates why scientists view events like Blanco quakes as wake-up calls. They are not catastrophic in themselves, but they remind us that the machinery is in motion, the plates are alive, and the locked subduction fault is still waiting to break. Oceanic transforms such as Blanco are safety valves of a kind, but they do not relieve the real monster strain. If anything, they testify to how restless the oceanic lithosphere is beneath the Pacific Northwest. To appreciate the mechanics more deeply, consider how a transform fault like Blanco operates. Two rigid plates slide past one another horizontally. Friction along their rough boundaries locks them temporarily. Stress accumulates until the rock strength is exceeded. Then slip occurs abruptly, releasing elastic strain as seismic waves. On Blanco, this manifests as strike-slip quakes such as the recent one. Unlike subduction thrusts, the motion is mostly horizontal, but the shaking propagates efficiently through the oceanic crust and into the overlying water, sometimes felt faintly on shore as a rolling vibration. The aftershocks of magnitude 3 recorded in the hours following are small adjustments, the crust continuing to realign in the wake of the main rupture. They too were shallow, about 10 kilometers deep, consistent with brittle fracture in the same domain. It is worth noting that the Blanco Fracture Zone has produced larger events in the instrumental record. A magnitude 7.2 struck in 1994, and several magnitude 6-plus events have occurred since. These serve as reminders that while most attention is rightly on Cascadia's megathrust, the transform faults themselves are capable of damaging quakes. Submarine cables, offshore infrastructure, and even coastal towns could feel strong shaking from a Blanco event above magnitude 7. For seismologists, therefore, the monitoring of Blanco is not an academic exercise, but a necessary component of hazard forecasting for the Pacific Northwest. As the data from this 5.9 continues to be analysed, researchers will refine focal mechanisms, map rupture planes, and compare with historical sequences. Each earthquake becomes a case study in how the Juan de Fuca plate manages the tectonic tug of war around it. The story here is not one of disaster, but of process. The earth is in motion, and the Blanco fracture zone is one of its busiest laboratories. When the plates grind, they reveal the invisible workings of plate tectonics, the grand choreography beneath the waves. For Oregon and the broader northwest, it is a reminder that beneath the calm sea lies a restless boundary ever capable of surprise. 
In the end, the September 25th quake was a moderate slip on a transform fault, a horizontal adjustment deep offshore. No tsunami, no collapse of cities, no catastrophic aftermath. And yet within that restrained violence, the planet whispered again of its immense forces. Cascadia sleeps nearby, locked and silent, its potential far greater. The Blanco fracture rattled, released and quieted for now. But the question remains, how long before the locked subduction zone follows suit? If you found this deep dive into Cascadia's tectonic forces informative, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Your support helps bring more science-driven investigative reports on the restless earth straight to you. Stay connected, stay curious and stay prepared.